So first off, uh, I work for Data Lab USA. Uh, our perspective really is uh, rooted in high volume direct marketing campaigns. Uh, we work for uh, a lot of you know, large players in the personal finance world uh, and in the insurance spectrum. Uh, we represent three of the top insurance companies in the U.S. and the largest personal finance company. Uh, we also uh, represent you know, large uh, political clients, large, uh, um, also you know, large nonprofit clients and educational clients, a lot of different clients selling a lot of different products with different target markets. Uh, but the direct marketing principles still hold true across you know, all, all the industries we serve. So the, the data environment for direct marketing, it's really categorized by lots of observations. Uh, you know, our clients in total are mailing over 500 million, or they're generating 500 million marketing uh, decisions per year. So we have a lot of good data uh, to model on and to produce further advancements down the road. Uh, also in this environment, we're dealing with thousands upon thousands of variables. Uh, so we're dealing with uh, variables from you know, individual credit level data, individual demographic data, uh, census data, geographic data, uh, lots of different variables coming from lots of different data sets. And you know, the goal for us really uh, is to aggregate this data and you know, use it in producing one measurement for our clients to action upon. Uh, and this measurement is different for different clients, uh, but it's deeply rooted in what they what their, the campaigns are going to be judged on. Uh, so maybe for one of our clients, it may be profitability. They want to uh, obviously optimize profitability, select the best prospects uh, based on a profitability metric. Um, for other clients, it just may be response or sales. Uh, it's really uh, you know, different forms of optimization. Uh, but the, our goal is to get from these raw data elements, these thousands and thousands of variables, to one of these such measurements. And to do that, we use what are called simulation models, which are actually models of models. Uh, so, you know, on the ground floor, we're, we're building a lot of sub-models that aggregate these different data sets, maybe exploit the idea of data homogeneity and, uh, you know, really uh, concentrates on segmenting uh, certain data sets really well. And they might be you know, targeting different driving factors of our end goal. So we may have a response model uh, that's combined with a conversion model. We may have, uh, you know, for in the case of profitability, we may have loss ratio models and attrition models that also come into play. So again, lots of data, lots of uh, data elements to use. Um, so, you know, we, we first we were a very early adopter of TreeNet. Uh, we started using TreeNet in the summer of 2002. Um, the, you know, it, it was clear to us that TreeNet was really made for the direct mail environment or, you know, this environment where we have uh, so many data points to action upon. Um, you know, the TreeNet models straight out of the gate, you know, they're obviously more robust than a lot of the algorithms that we had experience using uh, and everyone else in the industry had experience with using. In our environment, uh, many of the basic models that we created, the first pass models, you know, would include 200, 300 variables easily uh, in deriving their predictions. Uh, this really begged the question to us whether or not uh, all of these variables actually led to true informational gain, uh, you know, whether or not we had to include all of these variables. Uh, and, you know, the, the answer is, you know, no. Um, there's a lot of redundant variables. They may increase the uh, performance of, on the learned data set, but they don't necessarily increase the performance on uh, the, the actual validation data set. So this is, you know, what we term as, you know, a, a form of overtraining. Um, and what we found is we were able to really uh, decrease the number of variables util utilized in the models uh, without giving up really any true uh, performance gain when we scored a validation data set. Also, there's you know, different types of variables that I'm sure you as data, data miners have all uh, run into. And th these are high order categorical variables uh, such as maybe state, 
uh, or cluster code. Uh, and TreeNet really does a beautiful job with these variables in general, um, but you will notice that you still have to massage these variables uh, and you know, reduce the dimensionality in some cases, or in some cases also index these variables and to before input, putting them into the model. Uh, otherwise, again, you'll run into overtraining. Um, and this even sometimes leads to uh, models that are you know, less uh, discriminant, even on the training data set. Um, so you know, us as data miners, we all have our you know, best practices. Um, but usually, it takes a lot of experimentation to really find uh, the right, the most optimal uh, transformations to use in these cases. Sometimes uh, we may be able to rely on a categorical variable with uh, limited to only five orders of uh, uh, five degrees of freedom. Others, other times, we may be able to exploit 10 degrees of freedom. Um, it's really a case-by-case -case basis, and usually uh, it just takes a lot of testing on our end. Uh, with good variable selection techniques, you can really automate the testing process uh, to find the best transformations to include in your models and bring the most, uh, I guess, performance that's, that you can uh, get from these variables without overtraining. Uh, another set of variables I have up here are you know, composite variables. These are variables maybe such as cluster code or you know, FICO score, uh, family composition. These are variables that are really uh, composites of a lot of underlying driver variables. Uh, there, there's really, uh, they might be derived, for instance, family compositions derived from, uh, in many cases, gender, number of, uh, number of children, number of adults in a household. And really, you know, with TreeNet, it, it's very good at finding interactions. It's really unnecessary uh, to include such a derived variable in the model. And what you'll see is uh, lots of time, you know, doing so doesn't add any further improvement to the discriminatory power of the model. And it reduces uh, the ability to really identify what the key interactions are. Um, and, you know, it really reduces the interpretability of the models. And, you know, from the financial end, also, you know, FICO is kind of a derived variable in itself. We've all noticed that, you know, introducing FICO into a model may, it, it may come up as the top variable uh, in, in a model, uh, even though taking it out, you'd lose very little, if not any, uh, performance. Um, and, and also, you, you know, by reducing the variable space, you're able to specialize, or the model's able to get more Specialized, uh, you're able to reduce the, uh, or you're able to reduce the number of observations in the minimum ch in the children nodes, for instance. Also, you may be able to incorporate incorporate uh, more terminal nodes without overtraining. Um, all, and you know, lastly, you may be able to, you know, if you're using ICL, utilize uh, you know more higher order uh, interactions. Um, or you know, just use more interactions to gain even more performance. Um, and w w without being said, um, really reducing the number of variables in the model may just leads to a model that's much easier to understand. And that's really helpful for us um, because you know, usually we're in the situation where we're working with very large analytics teams, uh, you know, on the client end, um, and most of them have you know, heavy logistic regression backgrounds or backgrounds in, you know, other uh, fields. And uh, reducing the number of variables in a model makes it a lot easier to, uh, you know, explain to them. And there's a lot uh, more, better acceptance of the models. And this rings true also for, you know, compliance and legal teams uh, for their understanding of the model. Are there any questions so far? Or? Okay. Um, so feature selection, it, it's evident why we need it, uh, you know, why we gain some benefit from it. Uh, now the, the real question is, what's the best way to find those most optimal uh, variables in a model? And really, you know, in a brute force scenario, uh, it's really impossible uh, to find the optimal set of parameters, at least in our environment. 
Um, brute force scenarios may work with five variables. You might work with seven variables. But once you reach even 10 or 15 variables, it becomes uh, utterly impossible. Uh, so the formula is 2 to the n minus 1, uh, which represents the number of models that you'd have to test to test every combination of variables in a, tr in a model.